Good morning, Alex. This week, to commemorate the release of the Anthropocene Reviewed book, we'll be discussing the sky. The sky is what's up. More or less literally, if you're starting from the first sentence of the Wikipedia article on the sky, which defines the sky as everything that lies above the surface of the Earth. That feels exceedingly expansive, which is probably also an appropriate way to think about the sky, actually. On a day-to-day -day basis, though, when I think about the sky, what I'm thinking of is more similar to the astronomical concept of the celestial sphere. To borrow again from our concise friend Wikipedia, think of this as an abstract sphere that surrounds the Earth. The inside of that sphere appears blue in daytime, and to us, it's the plane where clouds and planets and stars appear to move. Despite the scientifically dubious geocentrism of this, the celestial sphere reflects the human experience of the sky, so we'll stick with it here. When I first thought about reviewing the sky, I thought of leaving the English building on our college campus, climbing down the hill behind it to the islands, and finding a soft place to spread out alone with a book after class. I'd tell myself to read, but what I would actually do is lay down and stare up at the uninterrupted blue of the sky, and not think much for a while. I would practice watching nothing change, and sit still, and eventually, I'd realize how weird it was that something so simple and unchanging could hold my attention like that. Of course, not everybody likes to just stare at the sky, and that's fine. But plenty of humans over the years have, and dreamed of being up there, in planes or balloons or spaceships, or just flying like a bird. The sky does have some kind of natural draw on humanity's attention. It might be something about the way looking up into it reminds us, as the reviewers of the Anthropocene Reviewed book would say, what it's like to be small and human. The sky reminds us that this place we're in is very, very big, and we are not. The sky is immediate and ever-present, no matter where you are outside on Earth, which means it's maybe the largest thing we all experience all the time. And no matter how uniform and stagnant the sky looks laying on an island in a Minnesota lake, it's actually always changing and full of variety. We like to think of humans as containing multitudes, but the sky is the original container of, well, all of us and everything else. It's easy to think of it as a void, just the transition into outer space. But what if it's full of things? I find myself forgetting how complicated the sky can be, until the afternoons when the sun shines and I'm being rained or snowed on. All thunderstorms can fill one side of the sky, and in another direction, everything is calm. But the sky isn't just external. It gets in our heads and underpins the way we understand the world we're in. Take time, which is so impossible to imagine our lives without that we think of it as the fourth dimension. The human relationship with time is ambivalent at best, and I'm not here to say exactly what time is at all. But we are always telling time by the sky, whether that's the time of day from the sun or the stars, or the time of the year from the weather or the quality of light. In the sky, I see the little changes in the seasons that sometimes slip my notice otherwise. The height of the sun in the evening, the way that the sky seems bluer somehow as we creep towards summer. You and I both know that time often feels fake or detached or arbitrary or irrelevant until I look at the sky and remind myself that time is not just a human experience and all of a sudden I feel retethered to the world around me. You might consider measuring the impact of the sky by all the linguistic and ideological cliches it inspires. Do all children ask why the sky is blue? Is the sky the limit, really? How many times will we still feel awe looking at a sunset, whether that's outside or on Instagram? The sky brings us sources of beauty like sunsets that we share with everyone alive on the planet right now, and with everyone who has been alive on the planet, and with everyone who will be alive on the planet because without the sky, no one will be alive. <laughs> but it can turn on us, too. The boredom and gloom of cloudy, rainy days. The foreboding of a sky full of thunderclouds. The deep disquiet of the light before a storm. The impossibly real horror of skies that are green or bruised and just promise only destruction. And so, the sky shapes how we move forward and our language, what we love, what we fear, how we feel, but that doesn't mean the sky is unconquerable. We shape it too. We may be looking at the same sky as people who are long gone, but we also aren't. Unlike them, we and future humans will see skies full of aircraft and weather balloons, satellites and space stations, and fewer stars, and more light pollution, and more smog, 
and more detritus of the things that humans make. I think that might be the most obvious, most unpredictable, and most powerful sign of the reaches of human empire over our natural world. The sky is no longer the limit, quite literally, to the ways we can shape our individual and collective destinies. We can touch that too. Unintentionally, as I'm writing this review, I continue to grasp at superlatives for the sky. What makes it so special? Why was I drawn to review it? I'm reminded of our recent conversation, where you suggested that the most remarkable place to pee is on a plane, because peeing in the sky, or doing anything really in the sky, is a remarkable testament to the human achievement possible in the Anthropocene. The sky so often serves as a stand-in for the human spectacular, and I want to have something spectacular to have learned from it. But we have affected the sky just like nearly everything else on the planet. It's not unique in that respect at all even if we pretend that it is. If I'm being honest, I decided to do this upon seeing the sun after it had been raining for four straight days. I thought, it's ridiculous how happy this makes me. I thought about all the other places in the world where it had not rained for the last four days, where people might also be looking at the sky at that moment. That's what's actually drawing me back to it as I write and rewrite this. There are many, many facets of the human-centered planet that make us feel discreet and disconnected from one another. But when I am looking at the sky, I can't help but imagine all the other people inside of this sphere. The kids dreaming of being pilots or astronauts, sailors navigating by the stars, storm chasers, inventors, daydreamers, everyone who's ever looked at the sky, and everyone who ever will. Maybe the sky means so much to us humans, individually and collectively, because it is common to so many of us, or because it can be a way into imagining the big world full of small people and places that feel so distant from us. It's the offer of perspective. Nothing under the sky is really all that distant from anything else. I give the sky five stars. <laughs>